you can see we're up here in Flagstaff, Northern Arizona, right around 7,000 feet. And it's rich in this really dense ponderosa pine forest. But like looking out here, you see no trees, nothing for about a mile across. That's about how big the basin of this lake is. So what's going on here is this whole area is the result of volcanic eruptions. For the past 6 million years or so, volcanoes in Northern Arizona have been periodically erupting, creating this big mountain range that we call the San Francisco Volcanic Field. As that lava is erupting onto the surface, you know, it's hardening into really hard, dense, igneous basalt. But that basalt is rich in all different kinds of minerals. So as water and snow melt and erosion kind of break down those igneous rocks into their mineral parts, some of those minerals kind of get converted into clays. And right here, what's going on, all that clay is kind of accumulating and it's creating a seal kind of at the bottom of this basin. So water can permeate through different kinds of rocks. Different levels of rocks have kind of different levels of permeability. But shale and kind of like mud rocks or just like clay rocks, they have really, really fine grains and it's very difficult for water to actually pass through them. So right here, we've got this big basin kind of filled with a nice seal of clay. And so as like snow melt and rainfall, it comes off the mountains, right here, it'll build up in the springtime. So right now you're looking out at a nice open grassy field. But if you come here, you know, six, 10 months from now, this could be totally filled with water and make a nice shallow kind of wetland ecosystem that's really important to our forests. What I'm looking for when I'm out and about is, you know, what kind of doesn't belong. We've got this nice natural basin, this nice natural prairie, but then all of a sudden right here, there's this elevation that's like long and straight. And you really don't find that in nature. So this is some kind of man-made raised area. And what this likely was, was a foundation for a railroad line. So going back to like the beginning of the 20th century, this forest was heavily logged and they used railroads to get, you know, the loggers out to the field and the logs back to the train. So this whole raised area right here was once a railroad line used for logging. But now it's a nice trail that you can walk along, enjoy the views. And this is a really, really great place to watch for wildlife because in these kind of forests throughout the Southwest, we have intermittent wetlands but they make up less than 1% of the total forest area. But that wetland, that water leads to huge biodiversity in vegetation in insects and in animals. So that wetland vegetation is really, really rich forage for things like deer and elk and pronghorn antelope, you know, our grazing animals. So they'll often come through here and graze on that nice wetland forage. Then, during the migratory seasons, the waterfowl, the birds that are migrating north and south, they need these pockets of wetlands to kind of rest and, and land on. So this is all part of actually two different corridors. So animals that are migrating kind of north and south will go through what they call the Woody Mountain Ridge Corridor, which basically runs from the mountain over there to Rogers Lake and then further on down until you get to the edge of the Colorado Plateau. So this is a very important migratory route for both birds and animals. But then also going kind of east to west, we've got a lake out to the east of us called Dry Lake. And then way out beyond those mountains over there is what's called Garland Prairie. And this is another important Garland corridor for the animals to migrate through. So as these animals are moving from place to place, you know, water is kind of the most important resource for life. So they need these intermittent wetlands so that they can migrate to new areas, to new foraging, to, you know, sometimes breeding grounds. So these wetlands are really, really important for, you know, the, the game animals and the birds that come through Northern Arizona. This mountain is part of the San Francisco Peaks. So that is the largest volcano in that San Francisco volcanic field. And on the kind of left side of the mountain there, you can see one peak that rises up higher than the rest. 
That peak is called Humphreys Peak, and at 12,633 feet, that is the highest point in Arizona. Then Arizona's other four highest points are the other peaks on the mountain. So if we start at the left, that's Humphreys. Right in the middle there, that's Agassiz Peak, coming in at about 12,360 feet. And then further to the right, you go over the saddle, kind of the next peak, that's Fremont Peak. And then kind of at the very end there, before the mountain disappears, there's one more peak called Doyle Peak. But those four highest points in Arizona are only a remnant of what that mountain used to be. That mountain used to be much higher than it is today. So that's what you would call an old stratovolcano. And stratovolcanoes are this kind of volcano that erupts in such a way where it kind of mixes, you know, lava rock with more like pyroclastic blasts and it builds up a very tall pointy mountain. So almost all stratovolcanoes kind of rise up to one central peak. But we don't have that here. We've got multiple peaks all in this kind of surrounding this one inner basin. So what geologists think is that when that mountain originally formed, all of those peaks connected into one central mountain range. So kind of try to picture in your mind's eye that slope coming up from the left to Humphreys and that slope coming up from the right on Doyle and Fremont will just continue way up higher into the air to where they would have reached at one spot. And that's how the volcano originally looked maybe about 500,000 years or so. The first eruption happened about a million years ago, and between about 1 million and 400,000 years, that volcano was active. It erupted a few different times, creating this massive, large stratovolcano. Now, the controversy comes up in what happened to the top of that mountain? You know, why isn't it there anymore? And there are a couple different competing theories that you'll hear around Flagstaff. One theory is that kind of similar to how Mount St. Helens erupted in the 1980s, is that this mountain formed its cone and then a secondary eruption kind of blew off the top of it and that's what gave us the Ring of Peaks. That theory though doesn't have a lot of actual geologic evidence. There's not actual like volcanic rock from that eruption that we can say, yep, this mountain definitely had a secondary eruption. The other competing theory is that basically the mountain and the cone kind of collapsed in on itself. So basically imagine that mountain kind of rising up to that central peak and then over time it couldn't support its own weight and it just kind of collapsed and crumbled in on itself and that might have gave us our ring of peaks. So either a secondary eruption or a cone collapse kind of led to the mountain's original downfall. But what's also been affecting the mountain for the past two million years or so at least are different ice ages. So over the past two and a half million years or so, the earth has gone through these cooling periods and during those ice ages, these mountains were high enough to have glaciers. So at one point in time, there was a glacier on top of that mountain that was four miles long, a thousand feet thick. It was huge. And when that glacier mel melted, all that meltwater would have flushed out the inner basin, taken away a lot of the top of the San Francisco peaks. Then there were a few more kind of glacial periods about 20,000 years ago, and then again about 10,000 years ago. And that's what we know of. There could have been even more glaciers going back even further. There's just not geologic evidence for that yet. So we had this mountain as one kind of massive big peak. And then through either a secondary eruption or a cone collapsed, it kind of exposed the inner basin. And then over millions and millions of years, through rainfall, through snowfall, and even glacial melts, this mountain has kind of eroded away until we've got this ring of peaks that you can see today.